Hello, everybody, and welcome to another vlog from the Clinical Negligence Group at Number Five Chambers. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about the landmark decision of the Supreme Court in the case of Khan and Meadows. Joining me today is our freshly minted silk in the Clin Neg Group, John Coughlin QC. Congratulations, John. Thanks, Jamie. Hi. Uh, also from the Clinical Negligence Group, Rebecca Livesey and JD Kembry. Good morning, both. And last but not least, uh, we have from our business and property group, Imogen Holstead, who's going to explain to us these strange concepts of duty nexus and the like that us simple clinical negligence lawyers don't understand. So thank you for that, Imogen. Thank you for joining us. Um, let's start, can we please, Jody, with you? And can you just explain for everybody watching the background to this case and the facts of it and how it ended up in the Supreme Court? Yes, absolutely. Thanks, Jamie. Um, essentially, um, Miss Meadows, the claimant, uh, in 2006, learned that she might be carrying the haemophilia gene. She approached her GP for testing to confirm this. Unfortunately, uh, the GP conducted the incorrect tests. She confirmed that Miss Meadows did not have haemophilia, but didn't make the referral for genetic testing. As a result, the claimant continued with her life, believing that she wasn't a carrier. Fast forward to 2011, and the claimant gave birth to a son, who uh, shortly thereafter was diagnosed with haemophilia. At aged four, he was also diagnosed with autism. It was accepted by all involved that this uh, diagnosis of autism was unrelated to the haemophilia, but the treatment of his condition uh, was complicated by the autism insofar as um, he would be unlikely to uh, be able to administer his own medication or manage his own treatment plan or the like. He would also probably be unable to live independently. Uh, it was also accepted that Miss Meadows, that or had Miss Meadows known that she was a carrier, she would have undergone fetal testing for haemophilia which would have identified the fact that the, the fetus was affected and she would have therefore uh, terminated the pregnancy. It was a, a wrongful birth. Um, the claimant sought all of the additional costs of raising her child, not just those associated with the haemophilia. The difference was somewhat significant. Uh, Nine million, if she was successful, um, was agreed. But alternatively, uh, if it was only the cost associated with haemophilia, the amount agreed was 1.4 million. Um, at first instance, back in 2017, the matter was heard by Mrs Justice Yip, who approached the matter, in my opinion, with, with some uh, empathy. She distilled the, the legal issue uh, as follows. Can a mother who consults a doctor with a view to avoiding the birth of a child with a particular disability, rather than to avoid the birth of any child, recover damages for the additional costs associated with an unrelated disability. There was much discussion, discussion of, and, and she gave much thought to um, the relevant case law. Um, in conclusion, in her judgment, she thought the facts here were more analogous to Chester in the sense that any pregnancy would have carried the same risk of autism, but on balance, a subsequent pregnancy would not have been affected by it. It was less comparable to the hypothetical mountain here that uh, I'm sure Imogen will explain later uh, in Samco. Following this logic, she asked, why should there be a distinction between a parent who did not want any pregnancy and one who did not want this particular pregnancy. In each case, the effect of the doctor's negligence was to remove the mother's opportunity to terminate a pregnancy that she would not have wanted to continue. Uh, and to draw a distinction on the basis of, of considering the underlying reason why a mother would have wanted to terminate a pregnancy, in her view, was an attractive, arbitrary and unfair. Um, so applying the but for test awarded the claimants nine million pounds. Uh, on appeal, it was argued that the scope of duty test as set out in SAMCO uh, had to be applied when determining whether the costs relating to autism were recoverable. 
The rationale was that uh, it is an additional test that protects a defendant from liability for every foreseeable factual consequence of their negligence. Um, the, the Court of Appeal approached it by looking at the, the purpose of Ms Meadows' consultation with her GP, which of course was to establish whether or not she was a carrier of the haemophilia gene. The issue of haemophilia was the focus of the, the consultation of the advice. Um, the focus was not the wider issue of whether the claimant should become pregnant, which is fact, factually different to some of the other cases. Um, on that basis, the court found that Mr Justice Yip didn't apply the uh, SAMCO scope of duty test, but reverted to the but for test. Um, and this hadn't dealt with the link that must be established between the scope of duty and the damage sustained. Um, the matter went uh, on to the Supreme Court. Uh, Rebecca, I think, will probably be able to tell us a bit more about that. Thank you, Jodie. Yes, Rebecca, much. so wh what happened when we got to the Supreme Court then, Rebecca? Thanks, Jamie. So um, essentially what the Supreme Court did was apply this SAMCO test that Jodie's already talked about. Um, but we mustn't call it the SAMCO test. According to the court, we've got to call it the scope of duty principle. Wow. Um, that's a test which is usually associated with financial advice claims in, in commercial matters and not really argued in, in clinical negligence cases previously. So that's the first thing, SAMCO applies. Second of all, clinical negligence is not a special discipline which receives special treatment. So the court decided there was no principal basis from excluding it from the ambit of this scope of duty principle. Um, and there's also no basis for confining that to pure economic loss cases. What the court is essentially saying is that this is all part of the tort of negligence. And then it explored that tort in a six stage framework, which we're going to discuss in a moment. So applying that to, to this case, what we're looking at in terms of scope of duty is considering the purpose for which the defendant was supplying services. So in this case, the defendant was uh, trying to test for carrying a behemophilia gene. And that's going to be something which is done in every clinical negligence case, potentially, and that's something which is em emphasised in the judgment. The impact of that in this case was that damages for autism weren't recoverable on these particular facts. And that's because there wasn't a sufficient nexus or connection between the harm that the claimant sought damages for and the subject matter of the defendant's duty of care. So again, that consultation was only limited to haemophilia rather than autism. And notably in this case, the haemophilia didn't cause the autism or make it any more likely on the facts. So therefore the defendant had no duty to this unrelated risk of autism and wasn't liable for these losses. So essentially in some, what the Supreme Court said is that we've essentially done a shift of the questions that we as clinical negligence lawyers sometimes think about in the context of causation and bring them into an analysis and a discussion on duty and its scope. Great, that's really helpful, Rebecca, thank you. So John, it's right, isn't it, when you read this very lengthy judgment, it reads something like a law lecture from university, which for at least us two was a very long time ago. Um, and uh, it Lord Burroughs, who's not part of the majority, but broadly agrees with them, does actually describe this as advocating a novel approach to the law of negligence, which is a bit of an interesting one. What do you make of all of that? Well, I think that is as close as one comes in the Supreme Court to administering a slap to his <laughs> colleagues. Uh, he, he thinks it's unhelpful and novel to go about it in the way that they did. In fact, none of them disagree. All seven of them agree on the scope of duty point, which was the subject of the appeal. They could have kept it narrow. It would have been an important decision, but they could simply have said, we agree with the Court of Appeal. They got it right. Mrs. Justice Yip got it wrong. Uh, but what five of them uh, have done is to uh, offer a helpful model, they call it, for uh, reframing effectively how one goes about assessing the tort of negligence, these six questions, which we will now see in every case, in every skeleton argument uh, in clinical negligence. And we'll work our way through those six questions uh, shortly, but it, it's a landmark decision for those reasons that they even wheel out the textbooks, not just the practitioner textbooks, Clark and Lindsay and Charlesworth, but Winfield and Jolovitz, 
So I did feel like I was back in the early 90s as I was reading it. So it's a new structural framework. Uh, it's uh, in place in all brands of negligence. There's a sister decision handed down in an auditor's case called Manchester Building Society in Grant Thornton. And we very helpfully have a member of our commercial group here to explain uh, the commercial background to those decisions. Yeah, that, that would be great. Before we come to that, let's we perhaps just run through each of those um, six questions in turn, just so our viewers can understand what they are. The first one they describe as the actionability question. I'm just looking at the judgment here and it's framed as, is the harm, loss, injury and damage, which is the subject matter of this claim, actionable in negligence? Now, some of us might think that loss, injury and damage is normally the full extent of everything you think about in terms of negligence and, and a tort, but they throw it all in at, at one of six there. Uh, and normally it's fair to say that this will be a fairly straightforward question, won't it? Because is, we all know that a tort's not complete until you have proof of damage. In most cases, it's going to be straightforward to show that there's been injury or some other form of actionable damage. There will be some cases, unusual cases, where that will be an issue, such as, for example, the plural plaques litigation and, and whether you can have symptomless damage and things like that. But in most cases, you know, is that, has there been a tort, has there been damage, is going to be fairly straightforward. Where it starts to get different and interesting, it seems to me, in the second question, which is described as the scope of duty question, which is, what are the risks of harm to the claimant against which the law imposes on the defendant a duty to take care. And that's also links to a later question, which is number five, about the duty nexus, which I'll perhaps get you to explain. Um, initially, Imogen, can you perhaps just talk to us about that from a commercial perspective? Because for us uh, clinical negligence lawyers, a lot of this seems quite new and quite surprising, but less so for you, I imagine. Yes, certainly. And I think it, it is interesting to note that certainly in the commercial sphere, the first instance decision of Khan and Meadows did cause some consternation because it was very much not SAMCO, which is what we're used to. So perhaps if I start with what is SAMCO, what is the point of SAMCO? Uh, now, SAMCO starts from the position that every transaction that you enter into is going to bear risks. And that is normally going to be more than one risk. So there's going to be a plurality of risks. And therefore, when you seek the professional advice, of any particular professional, there is a particular risk in mind that you are guarding against. Now, I think that falls perhaps more readily into a commercial sphere because the type of transactions um, that tend to end up in professional negligence cases um, have different professionals and different expert specialties for which you would seek different advice on different risks. So say, for example, if I were purchasing a house, I would ask my surveyor to advise me as to value. I would ask my solicitor to advise me as to encumbrances on the property. And I might advise, uh, ask my financial advisor to advise me on the wisdom of the transaction and the tax consequences. Um, what Lord Hoffman said in Samco was that you have to start from that position. You have to start from working out what was the purpose for which you sought that professional advice? What risk were you guarding against? And then looking at whether the loss that has been suffered is a result of that risk being brought to bear or a different risk that was inherent in the transaction being brought to bear. So Lord Hoffman does this with his well-known now hypothetical of the mountaineer's knee. So the idea is a mountaineer has a dodgy knee, he goes to his GP and says, is, is my knee fit in advance of me taking this mountaineering expedition? The GP wrongly advises that the mountaineer does have a fit knee, the mountaineer goes up the mountain and suffers an injury that is not at all a result of his knee, but is a totally foreseeable consequence of mountaineering. For example, he's stuck in an avalanche, he falls off a cliff, something like that. Now, what that's designed to do is to highlight that your traditional but for causation task doesn't work or it's too blunt at all. Because the mountaineer would say, well, if you told me about my injured knee, I wouldn't have gone up the mountain, I wouldn't have fallen off the cliff. Um, what Lord Hoffman says is, well, falling off the cliff was part of the risk of going up the mountain, but it wasn't the risk that you were asking your GP to protect you against. So, so that's the basically broad principle. Now, I think uh, there are two reasons why, as commercial practitioners, we feel a bit more comfortable 
with assessing that scope of duty from, from the starting point. And I think those are first that it would be a very rare case in a commercial context where you wouldn't also have a contract that was um, setting out a, a, a similar or concurrent duty of care and contract, and therefore you would use contractual construction principles to start by assessing the scope of duty. And the second reason is that we are very comfortable with this idea of there being different professionals who you approach to assess different risks. Now, Lord Hoffman in Samco, um, it's an excellent decision, but it is quite compressed, it's quite difficult, and it's caused a lot of commentary and a lot of consternation since. Um, he does love the hypothetical. So the second mm. hypothetical that comes out from Samco, which uh, you'll find discussed in Khan and in the Manchester Building Society case, which is concurrent to it, is this hypothetical counterfactual. Now, what Lord Hoffman says is that because you're looking to protect only against a particular risk, what you should try to do is apply this counterfactual analysis to work out if your loss is a result of that particular risk or a result of another risk. So the idea is you pose the hypothetical question of not what if the professional advisor had given correct advice, but what if the incorrect advice had in fact been correct? So say, for example, I buy a house, I'm incorrectly advised that the planning permission allows me to let it out as a holiday let. I find out then that I can't let it out as a holiday let and a coal mine opens next door, which devalues the property. Now, what the counterfactual would do is say, well, if I could let it out as a holiday let, I would still have suffered the diminution in value from the coal mine opening next door. So it's a cross check essentially to work out whether or not you're on the right lines for the scope of duty. It's just that um, it is a hypothetical and certainly in Khan and Meadows and Manchester Building Society, the Supreme Court seems to suggest it's not that helpful. Um, now, I mean, I'm interested in your views, but my view is, is that that's where the counterfactual finds itself in the fifth question, I don't want to jump ahead to the fifth mm. question, but effectively, I think what the Supreme Court is doing here, sparing Lord Hoffman's blushes, trying to find a point at which to, to do a cross check or a counterfactual. And that's where we get this, this nexus element. My view is it doesn't really add anything um, different from the other questions. It's just another point at which you cross check your scope of duty. Yeah, it seemed to me, I mean, I, I sort of tried to deal with two and five together at the mm. risk of confusing people watching because it, it seemed to me that in some ways asking whether there's a sufficient nexus between the damage and the scope of the duty of the care is almost part of the question of asking what the scope of the duty of care is and they will often probably be dealt with together. Um, uh, John I'd be interested on your views on that but also this, this counterfactual point that Imogen's already mentioned. I must confess, when I first read the judgment, I somewhat struggled with that because, as Imogen says, it's important to remember you're thinking about what the situation would have been um, had the facts been, had the advice been correct, effectively, which is sort of the other way around from how we normally approach it. What do you make of all of that? Yeah, um, th three things really. One, uh, two and five there will be overlap and they acknowledge when they get to five duty nexus question uh, this will often have been answered by your answer to number two but they're quite insistent that we keep things in order they want one actionability two there's a duty and there's some damage what is the scope of that duty before you come on to three four five and six as we will shortly um, five serves to be a cross check it's probably more helpful in valuers cases auditors cases where it's all written down uh, as to which risk has been allocated to whom. Uh, and in a, uh, an ordinary PI or ClinNeg case, five and two probably won't come up too much. If you're a driver, you owe a duty to other road users. Uh, we all know what the content of that duty is. We all know what the scope of that duty is. You won't need to revisit that at Duty Nexus. If you're a surgeon operating and you make a mistake that no reasonably competent surgeon should make, two and five are answered comfortably. Uh, it will only come up, um, it seems, and, and let's not forget the mountaineer's knee is a clinical negligence case. Mm. So perhaps we shouldn't be as surprised uh, as we seem to be by this decision. Uh, it will come up in advice cases and investigation cases. Um, so we must take them in order is the first point. The second point is the counterfactual. Again, easier in commercial cases because you can identify uh, 
what the advice was, and had it been correct, would this claimant still have suffered the same loss? I should say the other two justices, Lords uh, Leggett and Burroughs, uh, asked themselves the same question in slightly different terms, but come to the same answer. It is more difficult in medical cases, and the counterfactual in Miss Meadows' case is, had the advice been correct, that would mean she wasn't a carrier of the haemophilia gene. Hmm. She would still have had this baby, a Dejuan, when she did, with his autism. And so the counterfactual checks out, in this case, uh, that uh, the autism losses are not recoverable, not within the scope of this duty. So uh, that makes sense. And uh, again, none of the seven of them and none of the Court of Appeal would have reached a different decision. This was always the case confined to haemophilia losses. And the third point is, uh, and this comes up under number five, but we'll deal with it now, risk allocation. Everything Imogen's just said to us about checking the contract and who's responsible for what is to do with risk allocation. And there's some pretty blunt discussion as to the risk the GP took on versus the risk that faced Miss Meadows in relation to autism, but all the other hazards uh, of pregnancy and disabilities that, that may be caused during the course of pregnancy. That risk was placed fairly and squarely on mum, even though uh, she was presumably unaware of it at the time. So uh, yeah. it, it's going to be a question of answering uh, those questions in that order. Uh, I, I think in a few minutes, we might just touch on the practical effects of that and the sort of medical cases where it might bite. Yeah, I think that would be helpful. Let's just run through, so we're keeping it clear what the other questions are. So Jody, do you want to just talk us through the third and fourth questions, which will seem less alien to most of our viewers, I imagine? Absolutely. Um, the the third question um, is the the breach question. Did the defendant breach his or her duty to his or uh, by his or her act or omission? Uh, essentially, the the normal principles apply, um, and it's defined by the scope of of question two. Um, there was more consideration, more discussion about the fourth question, um, and that being the one of factual causation. This is something that we're all very familiar with, um, together with its limitations, um, but they do take the opportunity to, to discuss um, the issue, highlighting that it's a threshold test. It's a hurdle that must be surmounted, but it's not sufficient to establish uh, liability. Um, there's also uh, consideration of the limitations of the test. Of course, it can eliminate um, irrelevant causes in fact, uh, but it is inadequate if there is more than one wrongdoer or there's one more than one uh, cause for the harm, if one's looking for instance at material contribution issues. Um, so as they say, it's not a test with uh, universal utility. Given then that they take the opportunity to discuss uh, the issue uh, at some reasonable length um, with a sense of criticism um, towards the use of the but for testing clinical negligence. It may perhaps have been helpful for there to have been some further guidance or some clarity on the point, but I think there is um, an indication that there is lack of satisfaction, but with no real um, analysis of, of how that may change. Sure. Thank you, Jodie. I don't think there's anything particularly novel in that, despite the length of which they talk about it, really. So yeah. we've got all the way up to five then. So just to recap, number one, is there actionable harm you think about first? Then you think about the scope of the duty that we've talked about a bit length. Then was there a breach? Number four, factual causation. And then, then we get to the number five, which we've touched on already, and you think about whether there's a sufficient nexus between a particular element of the harm for which the claimant seeks damages and the subject matter of the defendant's duty of care that you've thought about at question two, which, as we said, seems really just a sort of cross-check once you get to this point in your six test to check that you define the scope of duty of care correctly. And then last but not least, Rebecca, we come to number six, which seems to be a sort of, without being too flippant about it, a bucket in which the Supreme Court chucked everything else that we have to think about. Do you want to just explain that to us? Yeah, I, I totally agree, Jamie. It's basically a, a mopping up exercise. Um, it's called the legal responsibility question by the court and the judgment. And the question is essentially this. Is there any reason why the claimant shouldn't get these damages that they would otherwise be due? 
So it's not particularly principled in its nature, but it's really a rundown of all the Latin terminology that we used in law school to finish off the analysis. So it's a catch all of things like remoteness of damage, intervening acts, failure to mitigate, contributory negligence for some reason comes in at this point, um, fundamental dishonesty presumably at this point, and, and the list goes on. Um, so it's a, essentially another emphasis that defendants are responsible only for the foreseeable consequences of what in, uh, you, you know, say a birth with, uh, with haemophilia, but nothing else. And that's all mocked up by the, the end question. Right, thank you. All right, so those are our six tests, John. Um, obviously, we can see how this is going to apply in the very specific facts of the Kahn and Meadows case, um, and perhaps to wrongful birth cases more generally, but obviously that's a fairly small subspecialty of clinical negligence work. Where do we think this is gonna be raised in other cases by defendants? Well, in any case, I think where there is an element of advice giving or information rendering or investigation work. So uh, think of those cases where uh, of incidental findings where an investigation is undertaken, say a chest X-ray following a road traffic accident for some rib pain. You can see the rib fractures, but the radiologist doesn't notice the shadow on the lung beyond. Uh, all of us, I suspect, have been told by expert radiologists that it is the content of their duty to check everything that's on the film, irrespective of what's written on the investigation request. And if they miss uh, the shadow on the lung, then that is negligent and the claimant has a claim in, clin in clinical negligence as a result. Now in that case, um, although I think this would be the, the wrong argument to take, I suspect it will be taken, the radiologist may well say, the scope of my duty was to look for a rib fracture. I was asked nothing else. I owed the claimant uh, no duty beyond that. And I suspect we are facing uh, many years now of, of litigation as all of this unfolds on all sorts of different flavoured questions along those lines uh, relating to incidental findings or advice, which if done competently would have led to a chain of investigations that would have resulted in identification of whatever the problem now is. Uh, so uh, if it is straightforward, surgical mistake, delay, whatever it may be, then nothing changes for Carnal Meadows. But if there's any element of advice or investigation or information, that's where I think we really need to, to screw our attention firmly on the point early. Yeah, I agree. And I can certainly see scope for lots of further litigation about this, because from a defendant perspective, you, that you're going to want to try and extend the application of this principle as far as possible, aren't you? Um, and equally well, for claimants, it could, well, quite, you know, it's, it's, it's understandable, isn't it? And, and there clearly still are some questions which are left open about how far this extends and how it, um, interrelates to other aspects of clinical negligence law, it seems to me. Um, for one example, there's, there's no real discussion, John, is there, about eggshell skulls in the, um, in the judgment and how that could interact with how you define a scope of duty and, and what you attribute to different causes. What do you think about that? That's right. This wasn't an eggshell skull case. There's no sort of prior vulnerability other than the existence of the haemophilia gene, but it, it doesn't lend itself to an eggshell skull argument, and that point wasn't taken. But one can imagine, one can see interplay between scope of duty and an eggshell, a prior vulnerable patient, uh, where the prior condition uh, plays some part uh, or has some exacerbating effect uh, with whatever the problem is that information advice is sought about. Now, um, we are going to see, I think, many, many cases with all these different issues having to be filtered out and if they enter play uh, well we'll see where that takes us. The other case as well that seemed to me John to be notable by its absence was Montgomery as well do you agree? Yeah uh, Montgomery is all about risk it's all about the reasonably prudent patient uh, and the risks to which they are entitled to be informed and it's all about autonomy. This is a case about risk allocation as well and it, I don't say for a moment that Montgomery conflicts with Kahn and Meadows. Uh, it's just slightly surprising that it was ignored entirely uh, when we're dealing with principles of risk allocation uh, within the judgment, 
they say this is a doctor who took the risk in relation to advising on haemophilia. Mum takes all the other risks. Uh, whether or not she was aware of that at the time uh, isn't explored and um, Montgomery not touched on at all. Yeah, I agree. The, the final point I was just going to mention as someone who deals with these sort of cases, which also slightly surprised me on reading the judgment, was it, the fact of costs being recoverable for a disabled child was treated by the Supreme Court as being a completely uncontroversial issue. Um, and in fact, a lot of us who work in this area tend to think that the whole basis for these claims is somewhat insecure because, as we know, we have the case of McFarlane where the House of Lords says you can't recover the costs of bringing up a healthy child in a wrongful birth case. Uh, in the sterilisation case in that case, then the Court of Appeal, lower court, says in Parkinson, well, we're going to distinguish McFarlane and say that you can recover the additional costs of bringing up a disabled child in those circumstances. But then after that, the House of Lords again, so a higher court in the case of Reese, which involved actually a disabled mother, says doesn't have to decide the point, but two of the majority in the case of Reese doubt Parkinson and effectively say that it was wrongly decided. So for a lot of us working in this area for a long time, it's been felt that there's been a bit of an uneasy compromise in how these cases are settled and dealt with. And actually the legal foundation, so the whole idea of getting the costs of a disabled child and whether you characterize that as pure economic loss or personal injury is all fairly uncertain and controversial. But throughout this judgment, you have the Court of Appeal saying, oh, you know, this is clearly a, a recoverable damage in tort. This is uh, settled law is uncontroversial, which I think is news to some of us, but may mean that uh, we can take these foundations for some of these cases of being a little more secure than we had thought previously. But of course, it wasn't actually an issue on the appeal. So whether that remains the case, if and when anyone takes the point further, we'll have to see. So still some unanswered questions. Um, I think lots of potential practical applications in this John has told as advice cases and incidental finding cases moving forwards and a lot for us to digest and think about. So can I thank all of my guests today for joining us? Uh, John Coughlin, Rebecca Livesey, Jodie Kembury, and particularly our special guest, Imogen Halstead, bringing a fresh perspective to some of these issues for us. Thank you very much, Imogen, for joining us. Uh, that's all for now. Please do keep an eye out for an article on this case, which we will hopefully link to below this video, wherever you're watching it, which Jody and John are putting the final polishing touches to very soon, uh, dealing with some of these issues and Khan and Meadows in a bit more detail. But as ever, thank you for watching and we'll see you next time.